Welcome to the Kiwimana Buzz. How to hold a frame, save the bees, stop the fee, inspections of our hives, and also the Wider Matter Home and Garden Show, which Gary attended, and a, a really cool music video that we happened upon uh, on a visit to a shop. This is the very first podcast that uh, we are holding here at Kiwimana HQ, and I'm um, really happy that you decided to join us and and be a part of it yeah thanks for coming everyone so should we start talking about the uh, first item oh well, we just might as well start off um with one of the blogs that gary did about how to hold a, a frame can you explain to all our listeners why you decided to put that together gary um yeah that was because we um we we feel that the hive had lost its queen and um, the reason why is because we're actually shaking the frame out and we think we, the queen fell on the ground and we thought we'd put her back in the in the hive okay, but it looks as though she hadn't and they, the, the bees actually raised their own new queen after that. So that's why if you're ever going to shake a frame or hold a frame above a hive, make sure you hold it above the actual hive and not over on the ground. So that was a pretty important lesson to learn, I guess. Yeah, it was, especially um, when it happened, it was coming up to winter, so it was a bit of a bad time to lose a queen. Okay, well, there's some advice that um, take heed of, that if you are opening up your hive and you are pulling a frame up, to keep it over the hive box so that if the queen does fall off, she lands in the hive box and just goes about her business. That's right. And um, the next topic is uh, wrapping up your bees in a quilt, which is an old idea that comes from the uh, wary hives, which is a French invention. Um, and basically, it's a, a level of um, a level with with actually sawdust or wood shavings in it, and you actually put a, a, a sheet of canvas over the bottom, and that sits on top of the top um, the top bars of the top hive. Um, it's been used for years and years in, in worry hives, and uh, we just we've actually made a couple for the Langstroth hives, um, and we're just going to experiment with that this year. And have you got any thoughts about that, Margaret? Oh, just that um, this is just some field tests that you're going to run over the winter time. Is that right? That's right. Yep, just do some field tests. Um, you can actually see some better photos on the blog. Obviously, this is an audio thing, so it's hard to show you what it does but it's basically like a Langstroth box with um, vent holes and a sheet of canvas at the bottom. Fantastic so go to our website and have a look at that one um, kiwimana.co.nz and there'll be a blog about the quilt level on the hives which we're field testing over the winter period. The next thing that we've been talking about is has been a pretty hot topic in here in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, we have um, a new council which has been set up called the Super to create a super city for Auckland. And what has it has involved is that there were seven councils, which we call legacy councils, which were actually dissolved. And then we had elections to have a single um, council set up, which is called the Auckland Council. And part of their um, working through all the things that they need to do as a new council is what they call the Auckland Long-Term Plan, which is part of their strategies as, um, as is required by central government. And we've been... <sighs> Well, fighting a, a fee that they want to introduce through this draft plan and we put submissions through. So um, what were your views on when we attended the hearings at the Auckland Town Hall, Gary? 
I think it went quite well. Um, there was a lot of beekeepers there, and it was good to see um, Kevin Palmer actually brought a jar of honey along, which was quite a good novel way to get his message across. Um, I, I, on our particular table, they didn't really let us speak because they basically told us that that fee wasn't going to happen, um, which is great, but um, we wanted some written written evidence of that, and uh, we're sort of still waiting for it, but we've had some other assurances today, haven't we? Um, from uh, is it Nick Feet from the council, and that's another a recent blog post about that as well. And I believe you've spoken to someone from the council today, Margaret. Yes, I spoke with one of the council representatives, um, and she has advised me that the reason they couldn't put together a written response was because the actual submissions were still um, being presented to the delegated authorities. And the delegated authorities are those internal council committees who make the decisions or consider the con decisions um, in relation to the proposals from the draft plan. So um, once that's been presented to them um, and they support it or not support it there will be um there will be an agenda going to the council committee on the 23rd of may and once that decision's been made we should be able to get an answer um to you and we can put that to you in writing on the blog and update you um an interesting point to note too is that when we did the submissions, there were there were actually not only beekeepers, there were gardeners, there were actually people who were um, honey lovers, and there were also in bee enthusiasts, people who love bees and just really want to help the bees. So there was quite a mix of um, submitters that you know we found. Um, who joined us to fight this fee. So we want to thank everybody who um, joined us and, yeah, supported removal of this fee. So um, we wait and see. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, was, it, was good to, it was a good day, and um, it was good that we met Liam Brown as well, which he, he was kind of non-committal on his answers, but... Um, Anyway, he said, he's, he said he'll do his best for the bees, so let's hope that actually happens. And, oh, also, uh, one thing too to remember is that Auckland Council do have bees on top of the town hall. So that's a great thing. That's a bonus and a plus for um, beekeepers. So if they've got one, well, everyone should have one in their backyard too. I don't, I don't see why not. So that would be a good. Uh, that would be great. Okay. Well, moving on. Um, inspections. Gary conducted some inspections um, on a couple of the hives, and yeah, with the change of the season, there are some changes that have occurred. So, um, what are the sort of things that you were noting when you were having a look through these ones? Well, definitely a lot less brood, um, and the bees are compacting into one level. So uh, we need to, um, if, if you haven't reduced your hives already, then that's something you've got to definitely do. Try and get them as snug as you can. There's no point having a huge empty space. It just um, it makes them harder to makes the bees it makes it harder for them to cluster in the winter days and. Just lately in Auckland, it's been very cold, hasn't it, Margaret? Uh, almost feels like it's going to snow, but it, it hasn't ever. <laughs> Last night we actually had um, hail come down, so it was pretty cold. Absolutely. And the other night we had a lot of lightning, didn't we? So, yeah. Yeah, we seem to have this weather, um, this weather bomb that, not really a bomb, but a weather situation that came over for a few days and there was they they had a look on the news they said that um there was like 1500 lightning strikes that were up uh, around the north top of the north island of new zealand so that was pretty interesting to to find out and then we were sitting here up on the hill at kiwi mana hq 
and we were just looking out the window and seeing all the lightning. So, yeah. Yeah, pretty scary. Well, Snow handled it well, so that was good. Yeah, absolutely. And the bees didn't actually uh, bat an eyelid, did they? They just sat, stayed inside. Yeah, most of them just kept to themselves. So uh, they're doing all the right things, and hopefully, um, yeah, they'll make it through the winter. And today it was a little bit sunnier, so there was activity, not huge amounts, but there was this coming and going and a few bees out there doing a cleansing flight. So... Um, yeah, and the other things, Gary's been getting up to um, supporting the Auckland Bee Club at the White Matter Home and Garden Show. So what sort of things did you have, um, what sort of things did people come and talk to you about, Gary? Um, yeah, that was really good. Um, they came up to to asking about bees. We, we approached a few people um, and asked them about the bees as well, and... Um, some of the questions are quite quite funny. Like one character, one guy actually wanted to have a beehive and have it um, hoisted up in a tree, and he wanted to lower it down when he was working on the bees, uh, which probably wouldn't work if anyone knows anything about bees and how they find their home. Um, a few people were scared that the bees would sting their children, um, and a lot of people seem to think that you have to have all all the land around your house to uh, for the bees to forage. Whereas you know, urban beekeeping, you could you could get away with a couple of square meters. Uh, so it's just different things, and I've, I'm pretty sure we actually got a few um, a few good people that came along, and I'm, I'm sure a few of them will, will be attending the bee club soon. That'll be great. We really need to keep um, promoting bees and and encouraging people to to take on beekeeping. Or at least if they have hives, um, it will give the bees a chance to, to grow. And sometimes there are, I think, benefits with having urban beekeepers because um, they can have their hives a bit isolated from others. So, you know, they've worldwide they are doing a lot of urban beekeeping in a lot of um, cities. So, and the bees seem to be very healthy. So... There's lots more to learn about um, about the actual urban beekeeping, but it seems to be a very positive approach, and we hope that um, with all the things that are going on with Auckland Council, that they will start acknowledging that and helping us to promote urban beekeeping. So that's something else we'll probably look into in the future. Absolutely, because uh, there's been some discussion that actually the bees in the city uh, actually are uh, more healthy because they don't get the pesticide issues in the town. And um, the other thing is they get a wide variety of um, of nectar sources, whereas in, in, ta- in countries um, they they tend to stick to certain kinds of things. Or, or we don't really have the monocultures here like they do in America, so we're kind of lucky. And that's that, and that's you know in that case, well, we don't have like fifteen hundred acres of corn or something, um, which is good for them. Yeah. So, you know, get out there, guys, and uh, get some get some hives going. So when you were at the Home and Garden Show and you were saying that people were coming up and asking you about questions, what were the kids saying? Were the kids asking you questions? Uh, the, a couple of them were, yeah. There was a couple of kids. So one, one small boy asked me if I was a beekeeper and he gave, gave me a hug because he said he likes beekeepers. So that was great. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, so I was hope, hopefully he'll get a um, hive. I think his parents are quite keen. Um, yeah, the kids were kind of, kind of quite silent generally, but they were all pretty, you know, a, little, a couple of them were very enthusiastic, which is great. A little bit of nervousness, I guess, um until people get to understand why bees do what they do. So I think that's um, interesting, yeah, to get that kind of feedback. Yeah, it was a good day too because uh, I was there with um, Anna and Andrew, and, and, and so that made the day really good. And Andrew's quite a character, and he should really write a book with all the stories he told us. <laughs> so yeah. when are you going to make him do that? I don't know. He, he's 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 threatening to do it, so he should be doing it soon. It was, he's quite a character indeed. Okay. Was there anything else you wanted to share with us about um, your experience of the Wider Matter Home and Garden Show? 
Um, no, it was it was all good. Um, no, I enjoyed it. It was an experience to just sort of meet members of the public. So overall, what's your thoughts on that kind of um, attending that kind of show? I think it's very positive because it actually um, gets gets big keeping out there in the public. And I, I think it's, you know, it, it makes it not so strange. But uh, the, ne- the next people that came along to, to man the store was Gary and um, Louis. And Gary was wearing his bee suit. So, I don't know. I, I, I suspect people would think that is strange. <laughs> yeah, it's all part of trying to educate and encourage beekeeping. So it's a start, isn't it? Absolutely. Okay, well, moving on, we go on to um, the day that you went into the music store. What what happened that day, Gary? Well, we, we've been talking about doing a, doing a podcast for a long time, and we went into the music store to talk to them, um, and we ended up buying a mixer and a microphone. They had a podcast special on, um, so that was great. And we yeah, met, handy, yeah, yeah, we met the bass player from a band called Tom Lark. And he actually mentioned he has got a um, beekeeping video, which is uh, one of their singles uh, about a about a beekeeper, which is quite amusing and it's a quite a great song. Um, that's also on the blog, but it, it just it just goes to show you when you when you talk to people out there about your your you know beekeeping or your passion, you tend to find people that have got the same things. Like just the other day, I was getting a haircut, and the hairdresser also has a beehive. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because we often meet people and then we say that we're beekeepers and they have, they say, oh, you know, my dad was doing it. And um, when we did swarm control this year, we actually found that there were guys who love bees and they, their parents kept bees. So it's, you know, they want to save bees and, and help us with that. So, um, yeah, it's, it is really interesting. So people talk about bees, find out what people are doing. You never know who's going to be a beekeeper. That's right. And, you know, don't don't be scared. Come along, you know, go to your local bee club. Um, Auckland's got two that we, we attend. And, you know, if, you, if you're in, a, in anywhere in New Zealand or the world, just look up your local bee clubs. There's probably one right near you. Yeah, so this music video was a bit of fun, and um, as Gary said, it is on our blog, so go and have a look at it, some Kiwi music, so it's all bloody good. So now, um, we just wanted to cover some feedback and give you some information on our website. We currently have 880 people who like Kiwi Mana. So we're really feeling positive about what we're doing and hopefully, um, you know, we can add to that as we go along. Um, we also had some um, some new subjects. Well, it's not new as such, but on Twitter there were some articles that Gary put on there about neonicotinoids and um, how... Bayer are really trying to tell us that you know these neonicotinoids are not harmful and nothing's proven and unfortunately um, we are finding information that is not supporting that so you know there's a, a big thing about the dollar that's attached to these neonicotinoids and controlling the food chain that are all issues that I think these will be going on for quite some time. Um, One of the things that we found is that the National Beekeeping Association in New Zealand put out a brochure that was a Bayer brochure Um, and unfortunately within that brochure I saw some um, information about Bayer saying that France supported and use neonicotinoids but unfortunately that's untrue and we have information that has been provided to us to show that neonicotinoids are being banned in France so in Germany also from what I understand but 
Yeah, because um, when Gil- Gillis Rat- Ratner was here, was here recently, oh, not recently, it was about a year ago now, wasn't it? He's the president of Epramondia. He told us they'd, they'd banned it. And he also said that the bees are actually becoming a lot more healthy. Yeah, there was some information on one of the um, on one of the Twitter discussion about the fact that neonicotinoids are also impregnated in seed, and in Italy they state that when they used seeds that were not impregnated with neonicotinoids, they had a really good uh, level of bees. Um, and no losses so that was really interesting so there are concerns Um, the brochure that Bayer put out also talked about um, that they are putting together some um, machines that actually uh, suck away the dust from when they are putting the seeds that have neonicotinoids in them which makes it less harmful but my question is, if it isn't harmful, then why would you need to have a machine that sucks the the dust away when you're going to sow those seeds? So, but the, but answer me that. <laughs> well, exactly. But but doesn't doesn't the actual problem is the uh, nectar and the actual plant get impregnated with the chemicals? That's the problem. It's not the dust, is it? Well, it is the dust because. The fact that they recommend a machine to suck the dust, because whenever you're working with any grains, there's always dust there. And what's happening is that the dust from when they put the seeds into the machines to sow the seeds, that dust has got neonicotinoids in it, and that blows in the wind, and that can land on the land, trees, anything. So that's where the harm is. Well, I think I think when you when you read a report, I think you, the big question you've got to ask yourself is who paid for that report and you know what was their motivation basically. Yeah, well, my point is is that this came out of the brochure that Bayer put um, that information in. So they're basically saying that people who 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 plant the seeds and who use sprays and everything like that have to do it in a in a more responsible manner. So they kind of mitigating their their responsibility and placing that responsibility on those who apply those chemicals or use those seeds. So um, to me, that is really irresponsible. Well, absolutely. I mean, the thing is that they, they're they getting banned in a lot of European countries, so I, I, I guess Bayer need to sell them somewhere, so why not New Zealand, eh? Unfortunately, that does seem to be the case, and... Um, you know, keeping those people on side is one thing, but actually promoting them. Well, I think we've had a pretty busy month here in um, Kiwimana HQ. The reason we started um, doing a podcast is because Gary and I have really enjoyed some of the podcasts that we've heard from all around the world. And, you know, we're all beekeepers and we're all gardeners and we all want to do our bit to help the insects and the animals around the world and I think it's wonderful and and we just hope that we can help with um, creating some understanding as well. So this is the first of many podcasts hopefully and we just hope you enjoy it. We'd love to hear your feedback um, if there's anything we can do better or you know you think we should be considering something else to to talk about or you want to bring in some subjects of your own. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. It's um, margaret at kiwimana.co.nz or gary at kiwimana.co.nz and we'd be happy to hear from you. Absolutely and um, speaking of other podcasts we were speaking to Kevin from uh, the BK Corner podcast, and he mentioned mentioned us on his podcast, which is great. Um, so if you get if you've got a chance, check out that it's the BK Corner, or if you look on the uh, links page on our website, you can check out his podcast. He's actually from New Jersey in America, um, but a lot of his stuff is still relevant for 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 New Zealand. Yeah, I think that's the interesting thing is that because we're here in New Zealand, while while the other side of the world's going through their bee season we're having a bit of a rest so it it is interesting to hear what's going on with the other people and have a look at how they do their beekeeping and we always know that when you're at a beekeeping meeting and you discuss a beekeeping subject every beekeeper has their own opinion so please share yours
Yeah, isn't it the saying that if you ask 10 beekeepers a question, you'll get 11 answers? Indeed. <laughs> Absolutely. And another thing about neonicotinoids, going into other news now, um, it's been discovered that some of the backyard pesticides that you buy at the garden centre actually contain neonicotinoids. So, you know, it's not just big um, farmers doing it. And if you look on the show notes for this page, there's actually a great article that the um, Albuquerque beekeepers have put out, which is a, 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 a thing you can take along to the garden centre, and it has actually the product names of these uh, products with these chemicals in. So we'll have to get down to the uh, local garden centre, won't we, Margaret, and um, have a look at see if they stock these neonicotinoids there. Yeah, I think that's something that um, we're going to be doing is have some projects that we will be working on, and that'll be one of them. We'll go to local um, beekeeping, uh, I mean, sorry, to garden centres and have a look at what products they provide and whether they are bee friendly or whether the garden centres themselves are, you know, just ask the question about whether they are aware of the plight of bees and if it affects them. Yeah, absolutely. And we can also get a um, cake and a coffee as well while we're there, can't we? Oh, yeah. Some of them have some yummy cake, that's for sure. They do. But if, if we find a neonicotinoid, what we could do is hide. We could hide them. Or would that be <laughs> bad? Uh, no comment. <laughs> um, and then moving into more news, the uh, Waldorf Hotel in New York City has installed six beehives on its roof. Um, and the, their goal is to actually harvest their own honey, which is, you know, fantastic. Um, urban beekeeping and in a flash hotel. That's fantastic. I think that um, if we can get more high-profile companies to start endorsing bees and beekeeping and hives and that kind of thing, that will be a really great way for us to um, really engage companies on a corporate level. That would be fantastic. It would be. be great. And other, other news, but this is actually specifically to New, for New Zealanders, is uh, the um, blood-sucking varroa mite, which is the bane of most beekeepers in the world, has actually got, got down to the bottom of the South Island now. Um, it's ended up in Invercargill, which is the very almost the very bottom of New Zealand. Uh, so that's bad news for the local beekeepers down there. Have you heard any um, feedback from any South Island beekeepers? Um, I have heard that some people uh, um, have lost hives already and because they obviously weren't checking for the varroa mites. Um, I, I have a feeling that with the, with the winter, because the varroa mites tend to uh, ramp up their breeding about now, I, I, I think they're probably going to find they're going to lose a lot of hives this winter, my, is my feeling about it. Yeah, I guess that, that does fit with the scenario that we've all gone through up here in Auckland and um, Randy Oliver talked about that when he came to New Zealand that they've gone through a lot of stages and they're coming to, I think he said about their fifth stage now whether their populations are actually starting to build up again and are appearing to be a lot more healthy so one of the things that they'll be going through at this point is maybe a bit of ignorance because they do, they aren't aware of what's happening to their, their um, hives so I just hope that someone will go and talk to them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, they need to get their local bee clubs involved. Um, they need to start getting working out what to do. Um, you, it's you know, you have to change your entire way you beekeep now. It's it's not as easy as it was fifty years ago. You know, so yeah, hopefully they can do something about that. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, beekeeping you know historically has been pretty standard practice and go out and you do your bee season and and then you close your hives down you know you do your extractions and everything and then winter comes on the hives are reduced and yeah you leave them to it and then the next season things start again but in modern and more recent times beekeeping has had a lot of issues that are basically affecting the health of the bees and also how we beekeep so it's interesting to see what happens when the um, when these changes happen and how adaptable the beekeepers are we know that the bees are very adaptable and that's why they've survived so I just wish the South Island all the best with that and hope that they you know that 
they're getting the support they need and I'm not sure maybe we need to have a look into that over the next month and see if we can find someone down there that we can communicate with and, and see what we can do to help. Yeah, we'll um, do that. I know, I know a few people down there, so that's probably a good idea. Um, another other news about breeding a better bee, which in Ireland, is beekeepers in Tipperary uh, are breeding bees that resist for our mites, which is similar to the project that, that was happening in New Zealand on Mercury Island, which has since ended. Um, I think they kind of couldn't work out how to do it, or they couldn't um, perfect it or something, so that's ended here. So good luck to those guys in Ireland. Yeah. Any comment about that, Margaret? Well, my view is is that one of the best ways I reckon to deal with it is to to breed from the hives that obviously survive. And if you have hives that are strong and survive over winter despite the varroa situation, then they're the ones that you should be breeding lots of queens from. So they'd be creating the the right genetics for the bees to survive. So I guess that's one way to do it. I mean, we're we're way at the beginning of our um, beekeeping experience, so that's something that um, we'll probably look at over the next few seasons um, with the bees that survive and the hives that survive over the winter period. So for us, that's our newest challenge, and that's seeing how our hives survive in the next, you know, when we come to the next bee season and um, seeing if our beekeeping practices are working properly and that we're doing the right thing. So that's, you know, what we'll be blogging about over the next, you know, six months or so. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to be looking at some other solutions in the next few months with um, oxalic acid. Oh, I've he- I hear good things about that from people in England. So we're probably going to do that in, is it June, July? Is yeah, right? probably July would be the... Because um, we have chosen to do um, treatments every three months. So that's four treatments across the year. Um, and the reason we've chosen to do that was because because Randy Oliver said that that's one of the key things to providing the bees with the best help they can get, covering all the periods when there's low brood and then when you've got the hive really packed. Um, the other things that Randy Oliver talks about, which I think makes so much sense, is having plenty of food available to the bees. So what we did is we did a um, feed after we did the treatments um, in April. And the bees are just have been very happy by the looks of things. And yeah, so we'll probably be looking at giving them another feed soon. But we've also kept honey on the on the hive. So we've, we actually have got two levels at this stage. The top level is absolutely chocker with um, honey. So what we'll probably need to do in the next uh, few weeks is to prick some of that honey open so that they have got some extra feed. Um, one of the other things we did do too with the change of the weather is we added some polystyrene in between the hive lid and the hive mat so we are hoping that that gives them a bit of warmth when they start clustering yeah we hope hopefully hopefully they will um speaking of randy oliver he did a good review of the uh might away cook strips um so check out our blog blog about that it does sound like a um uh, another good way to reduce the mites it's using folic acid um and we, we're looking, hopefully, going to be selling that uh, once we've tried it out. Don't you mean formic acid? Oh, yes. That's right. Formic acid. Um, even though it does sound a bit scary, um, yeah, I, I encourage you to investigate that for you and look at your bees. Yeah, it's interesting because when we um, when I read it, I was like, okay, there are some things that need to be, you have to do to look after the be- the bees while you're doing it. So, yeah, we're still to use it. Um, It's a product that we're hoping will work because Randy Oliver said that he uses it on his hives and he gets good results. So, yeah, we hope to be using that pretty soon once it comes into the country. Yeah, hopefully it will. Um, The the hair hair does actually reduce the brood a lot, so that's probably scary for new beekeepers. But... um, 
the good thing about it is it actually it actually does kill the mites inside the brood cell where other treatments don't. So, and, and it's a it's kind of like a shock treatment. So it's only only for seven days, not not the usual sixty days or four months or you know month long ones. So yeah, I mean the one the treatment that we've just done is the Epilifar. And that one, we had to do it every seven days for three times. So yeah. for commercial beekeepers to have a treatment that you just put in once and you don't have to worry any further, that's that's a definite bonus with this Mite Away product. Yeah, definitely. So that's that something we'll probably look at in spring. We're just still waiting for the approval from Math from that. So uh, let's ha- see what happens there. Okay. Was well, there anything else you wanted to cover, Gary? Have you got anything else on your list? Um, oh, there's only one more thing. The um, they, they're saying that there's going to be elevated mite loads in the hives coming out of the out of the U.S. winter. Because what happens if it's a, if it's a warm winter, then the mites don't tend to die off like they usually do. So they're actually, you know, constantly breeding all through the winter. So that they're saying that there's going to be a lot of uh, mite losses, but I I, I haven't really heard that because I, I follow a lot of got a lot of from bee bloggers in America that we follow. And I haven't heard of that, so I'm not sure if this, you know, depending on the area. But that's that's a concern because what happens over winter as well, if it's a mild winter, the bees tend to fly out more and they tend to eat more food. So they sometimes starve in the early spring, So, which isn't a concern for us in New Zealand at the moment because we're going into winter. But um, for any, anyone listening in America, that's something to think about. Oh, well, I hope that um, our cold winter will be enough to just knock them on the head without giving encouraging them to um you know to do to breed more uh, i suppose we'll find out once we get through the season but um hopefully the regular treatments that we're planning will really you know help the bees i mean i think the bees are looking good when we did our last inspections we didn't see any deformed wings or you know brood that was um dying so we were we were pretty satisfied that we had been doing the right things this year. Yeah, I, I think we have. So we'll, let's see what happens, eh? Yeah. In closing, we just want to thank everyone for listening to the Kiwi Mana Buzz. And, um, you know, we do appreciate your listening and we do appreciate your um, actively partaking in our blogs and giving us comments and feedback. It really is helpful. And we love it. And um, join the Kiwi Mana Buzz and see and hear what's happening at Kiwi Mana over the coming month. I've got a few things here as a bit of a taster. Um, we'll be going over the hearings decision and letting you know what um, what happens with that and how the delegated authority decides to go with banning the fee. Um, the other thing is, is we'll be planning our second podcast, so we really would appreciate any feedback you know in the next few weeks to let us know how you thought we went okay and what else were you thinking we were going to cover over the next month gary um i was just going to tell people about the upcoming events coming along in new zealand there's there's a uh, beekeeping how how do we say this again Uh, in wananga Uh, wananga that's meaning a conference or a meeting up in northland that's on the 2nd of june uh, there's also on the 9th of June, the Auckland Bee Club is having a 65th anniversary. So that's fantastic, 65 years of beekeeping. And on the 10th of June, the Franklin Bee Club, our one of our favourite bee clubs, isn't it, Margaret? Oh, I love going there. They're always great. Yep, and um, on the 23rd, we have a... It's the first New Zealand Natural Beekeeping Conference happening in Havelock North on the 23rd of June. And uh, Marcia is going along, who we met at the last conference. And I believe Janet Luke's also speaking. And so that sounds like a great day out. Uh, maybe we could go down there. That sounds great. I mean, I, I yeah, well, well put, we don't put know. me on the spot. I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, that's great. There, uh, you know, there's, there's work going on there, out and about. Yeah, go to your local bee clubs, even if you're a gardener. Go along, have a look what's going on in the um, beekeeping world. Um, if you're a local producer, if you grow vegetables or fruits or anything like that, go along, meet the beekeepers. 
you know, see what you can do to help and um, promote having bees and for your pollination and find out about those kind of things that will help you get really healthy crops, you know. Find out about um, chemicals and and the the results of the, the chemicals you spray, you know. Maybe get some more information about what you could do to um, avoid sprays, you know. Talk to natural beekeeping people. You know, go along to maybe some of these um, meetings and, and meet your local local people. And, yeah, I think it's a um, great opportunity for us to all network together to really promote health and well-being on the land and the air and with our insects and animals and even for our own food, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've actually came up with a saying. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. But if you can't keep bees, plant seeds. Ah, oh, that's a good one. That's a great <laughs> one. So that's it. We'll, we'll end on that. Oh, no, no. One more thing. Our, our good friend Paul Jenkins, yeah. uh, he's the Manab- Manabatu Bee Club, and they're having a meeting on the 28th of June. We can't forget the Manabatu Bee Club. They're the, uh, they're the first bee club that listed the Kiwi Mana blog on their uh, website. So, so we that's, love uh, them. <laughs> 28th of June, Manawatu. Yeah, so if any of those meetings um, sound sound good to you, go to our website and have a look and click on the name and you'll get more details about the location and timing and stuff. So, yeah. Oh, we'd love to hear if you go along to any of these events You know, pop us an email and just let us know what you thought, you know, and if there was anything that you picked up that you want to share. But, yeah, just let us know. That'd be great. And further to that, just check out our website, kiwimana.co.nz, where you will find everything you need to know about us, our products and our philosophies. Absolutely. Thanks, Margaret. Okay, well, it's all good, and have a good month, everybody, and we'll talk to you next podcast. Yep, love you, Margaret. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Kiwi Mana Buzz. Buzz. <laughs>